and now I'm quoting her words, who must maintain an extreme of cool objectivity about the most intimate of human activities, disciplining their personal responses to deliver an impartial and consistent product to their clients. And I think it's true. I think most, of, most designers today, they, they spend a good portion of their creative lives catching the eyes, catching the eyeballs, stimulating desire, producing desire, and moving the merchandise. And I think that, uh, I wonder how many of us can even imagine what it feels like to design something outside of the capitalist imagination. So, having said all these bad things about design, I, I, I have to tell you that, uh, that I do feel that there's some sort of a resurgence going on. I, I feel, uh, especially among the young people, uh, many of whom I've talked to ever since we launched that uh, First Things First manifesto. Um, I feel a kind of a new vitality among these young designers, these students. Um, I think that among these students we have a few mavericks again, some of that old passion of the, of the old uh, the movements of design. And, and uh, I think design has, has some, some really nice new possibilities again, and it, it, it is starting to get really interesting again. There are some interesting possibilities and interesting twists. Um, and I think there's some interesting mind shifts going on in, in, in design today. And we're at the very early stage of many of these, design, of these mind shifts, but, but they're happening and, and, and they're very exciting. Uh, I think the very first big mind shift that's happening in our profession right now is that, that we are going green in a, in a very big way. Um, there's a kind of a greening of, of design going on, a greening of our profession. Um, and I think this is one of the really wonderful, great trends happening in, in design right now. Um, many of us are, are going beyond just simple eco design, you know, and just trying to be coming up with sustainable products. We we're actually becoming deep ecologists. And we're pioneering, I think, a, a different kind of an aesthetic, an aesthetic that's somehow more organic and, and it gets away from that modernist perfection and, and, and it somehow feels down to earth and, and, and I don't know what the, what, the, you know what the next big aesthetic will be but I feel that, that there is some, it's got something to do with, with you know, the earth uh, and, and life, living things. Um, so I think we are pioneering a new kind of aesthetic and, and we're, learning to, we're learning to play. We're learning to play again in the in, in this great kind of a playground of nature. And we're including the, this whole idea of nature in, in, our, in, in, our, in our thinking and in our designs and in, in our aesthetics. Uh, maybe we're becoming a little bit like those rabbits that I saw when I was a young man in Australia, learning how to really play again. And, and for me personally, um, I, I had my epiphany about this uh, one day when I was flipping through a some sort of an art book or design book, and I came for the hundredth time, I came again across Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Waterhouse. Uh, but this time, I don't know, I must have been in a funny mood, or maybe I had a couple too many vodkas or something. Um, and this time, instead of seeing the, the house, I suddenly started seeing the trees, and, and, and then I started Seeing oh, behind the trees, underneath the trees and earth, there's the, the roots of the trees and, 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 and there's, a, there's water that's flowing right into the earth and flowing all around it and I started to hear the water and then I could feel the, the, the sunlight somehow coming in there and working on the leaves with the, the photosynthesis and, and then somehow it got kind of, got a bit of that same mystical feeling that I, I remember having a little bit when I saw the rabbits and, and I, I remember even thinking, wow, I can just see the snow falling here tonight. And, and, and I started feeling some of the patterns of the snowflakes in, in, that are going to fall here tonight. And, and I suddenly realized that the design, the really good design here, isn't really the house. It is the billions and billions of years of human evolution, or not human evolution, of, of natural evolution. That is the really fantastic design here in this picture. Uh, and uh, and then I, uh, 
I came to the, this is the moment when I realized that my ego is just too big uh, and that, uh, uh, that nature, nature in every way is a far, far better designer than I will ever be. I think the, the second uh, big mind shift that's, that's this curveball that's going into our profession now is that we're starting to, to play around with not just the, the glitz and the marketability and the, the usual kind of uh, uh, market-related uh, properties of, of our products, but we're starting to play around with the, the psychological side of the, of the products that we design. Um, so somehow the, the mind shift is away from the, the glitz and the saleability to, towards a, a kind of a, what will happen to this product when, when it's used by the user? How will the user feel? Uh, how can we manipulate the, the behavior of the user? And I think that this, this thinking about how the product is used, not how it's purchased and, and how great it looks on the shelves of the shops, but how it's used, maybe for five, ten, maybe even a hundred years after it's produced, it's going to be used, and, and how is it used, and what, how does it change the behavior of the, of the user? Um, and I wanted to give you very quickly a few examples of, 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 uh, of what I call psycho-design. This is a really crazy example of psycho-design. It's, it's, it's a vodka glass, uh, and it is designed to, to take some blood from your lips when you use it. Uh, I know it sounds crazy, but, but it's a good way to introduce this idea of psycho-design because uh, imagine that you're an alcoholic and your mother or your, one of your friends gives you this glass. It's, it, makes you, it makes you think it, it's something that's sitting there, even if you don't use it, it's something that is constantly reminding you that, uh, that, uh, that somebody that you love, is, you gave you this glass and, and that you have a problem in your life. Um, another example of, uh, a good example of psycho design is this, uh, w what I call a TV cozy. It's, uh, I think it's more powerful than a, a tea cozy that the, the British people use. Um, and I think uh, I can imagine uh, a lot of people, uh, I don't know exactly what it's like here in, in Germany, but in North America, a lot of people are, are TV addicted. You know, the TV is on all the time. Um, people turn on the TV as soon as they come into their apartments and, and, and some they sit there, you know, staring at it for hours on end. And so imagine one day in a house like that where there are a few TV addicts, suddenly somebody puts this on. And it's suddenly, it's not possible for you to pick up the, the remote and just switch on the TV anytime you like. All of a sudden, somebody's saying, no, don't do it. Somebody in the house is going against you, sending you a message. We're watching too much TV. And I think that if you think about it, that simple design of a TV cozy, it changes the whole mood in that house, in that apartment. It, it changes the whole psychodynamics of living in that apartment. A very powerful piece of psycho design. Uh, another example that I really like is this squat chair. It, uh, it's a chair that is unstable. It, it, uh, you have to learn how to balance. Uh, it's not just something that you can plonk yourself into and, and, and go to sleep. Uh, and it's, it's a really good chair for people who are overweight. Who need to take off some weight? It's a reminder that uh, that life is to be on the move and not to not to sit there like like an idiot all day. Another example that I really like is this uh, electricity meter, uh, and I remember a, a really good uh, friend of mine who who was one of the co-authors of the Club of Rome uh, book uh, many 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 years ago. She she died now. Um, she told me this story about how the the manager of a of a housing complex was trying to reduce the energy consumption of, of uh, all the different uh, houses and apartments in, 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 in her complex and, and nothing seemed to work. So one day she decided to, to take uh, this meter that usually was hidden somewhere in the back rooms and nobody ever saw it and she decided to put it right next to the, the entrance to the house. So as you're leaving the house, you, you, you're opening the door and you see it right there, you see the thing going around. And, and it reminds you that every time that you leave the house, every time that you come back, it reminds you that you're using energy. 